It's time for another beer, rum, and rock and roll rock shot. This time, Brian McCullough and I are celebrating the 30th anniversary of Pink Floyd's 14th studio album, The Division Bell. Released on March 28, 1994, it debuted at number one on the Billboard Top 200 chart in the U.S. and was certified double platinum. It would eventually go triple platinum in 1999, selling over three million copies. The album was produced by David Gilmour and Bob Ezrin, who had previously worked with Pink Floyd on their 1979 concept album, The Wall. The band consisted of David Gilmour, lead vocals, guitars, bass, keyboards and backing vocals, Nick Mason, drums and percussion, and Richard Wright, piano, organ, synthesizers, and lead and backing vocals. All right, Brian McCullough, welcome back, buddy. You are my go-to uh, guy when it comes to Pink Floyd, so welcome back, man. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. It's uh, Yeah, you and I have talked Floyd over the years. Absolutely. And uh, there's always something to talk about, and hence, here we are talking about it again. Exactly. What are you drinking tonight? Actually, this is um, it's from Brooks, a brewery in Brooks. It's uh, called Piston Broke, so kind of a play on words. Awesome. <laughs> Piston broke. I got a little uh, rum and coke going here for a change. I'm holding up the rum part of the show tonight. So there you go. Cheers. Hopefully I don't unravel. <laughs> okay, man, let's not waste any time. Let's go back to 1994, man. Now you're a huge Floyd fan, as am I. Talk about what sort of memories you have and what kind of impact this album, The Division Bell, had on you way back then, man. Talk to me about that. The CD era had come along, right? Yeah, I bought it on CD and played it on loop for many, many days and weeks, probably actually, when I first got it. I loved it when I first heard it. I thought it was an upgrade on uh, Momentary Lapse of Reason. I thought it was a better album. I didn't even really even think about it. I just played it more, you know? It just was more pleasure to my ears than than that previous piece of work. So there's some good stuff on that album too. Don't, don't get me wrong. This one just uh, had more pleasing tones. The guitar work on it is uh overall is just great so by this guy mr gilmore yes that's the guy he's your guy hey that's why we tune in really at the end of the day isn't it <laughs> yeah <laughs> to hear him play it is his playing on this album throughout is amazing there's not a bad song on the album i don't think man you hit the nail on the head with the cd comment yeah the cds were in full flight here hence the 66 plus minutes of running time on this thing right cds are getting longer and longer for better or worse but yeah, I was like you, massive fan of the band. And anytime they release something, well, you're super stoked. It's not like they're pumping out an album every two years. Like it had been seven years since Momentary, right? So I'm all over it, just like you. Yeah, of course. But see, I'm, I'm the opposite of you. I thought it was just just a little dip down from Momentary. Like I like Momentary better. Just, really, eh? Yeah, I do. So that's interesting. interesting. Yeah, Well, yeah. that's cool because, yeah, everybody's ears are different, right? So I can guess why, in some respects, why it is more pleasing to you. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that probably. We'll get into that, man. Yeah. And to be honest, I mean, both those albums, I'm a bit torn. I like them both. There's some amazing tracks on both of them, Brian. We all know that. But you don't have Roger's input. So to me... They're not fully realized Pink Floyd albums. Something's missing and it's Roger, right? Because I think there's 70% Gilmore, 30% Floyd. I'd go that far, right? There's definitely Floyd vibes on both of them. I mean, you got three of the four guys on them. I get it. But most of these tracks could have easily been on a Gilmore solo album. And that's not a dig either. I loved both his solo albums up to this point. The 78 self-titled one and About Face. Love them both. There's just, without Roger... Well, you don't have his lyrics for starters, right? You got Gilmore's wife writing most of the lyrics. So there's that. It's just yeah. a bit slicker, a little more commercial. But at the end of the fucking day, Pink Floyd's name is on it. And even without Roger, it doesn't ruin it for me. But to me, no Roger, no Floyd. You know what I mean? Yeah, I was just going to say that comment, no Roger, no Floyd. There's a lot of people in that camp. And I think you and I are both in that camp too. It, it does lose something. It's a bit weird. Them taking the name, the battle. It's really not Floyd. It really never felt like it was Pink Floyd. It felt like it was something less than that. I got it, Brian. It's part Floyd. <laughs> it's part Floyd, yeah. Ah, see Perfect. what I did there? Pretty quick. Pretty witty. Eh? 
Okay, man, let's get into the music. But before we do, you know me, I got some, I got my fun facts. I'm going to try to blast through them as fast as I can. Ready? Okay. Well, second album without Roger, we already kind of touched on that. The title refers to the division bell rung in British Parliament, apparently, when announcing a vote of some sort. Uh, Storm Thurgeson, longtime Floyd collaborator, provided all the artwork, which is really weird and cool, right? It's these metal heads in this field. There you go. Hold that up. Yeah, absolutely. Like, that's not... Photoshop kids, those are real. They're the height of double decker buses. They're fucking huge. So they're two faces talking to each other, and together they form another single face, which of course is a reference to Sid. Sid's everywhere, apparently. There you go. See, my CDs are in storage, Brian. It's too much of a pain in the ass for me to dig them out. So th- nice work. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, the last Pink Floyd album or studio album to be composed of entirely new material. And it's the last one with Richard Wright, keyboardist who died in 2008. Speaking of Wright, it features his first lead vocal on a Pink Floyd album since Dark Side, that song Wearing the Inside Out. So that's kind of cool. The recording took place on Gilmore's houseboat, which is interesting. He converted his houseboat into a recording studio called Astoria. So that's kind of neat. And that's it. That's my fun facts. You got anything to add to that? You got another fun fact that I missed? Uh, I don't know if you mentioned Guy Pratt was on bass. He, was, he did some work with them in the past. Well, let's talk about that. So most of the tracks are written by Gilmore and Richard Wright, with a couple exceptions. And I, like I said, Gilmore's girlfriend, wrote, Polly Sampson, wrote a lot of the lyrics. And you're right. Guy Pratt played the bulk of the bass. Dave played some. So he's worth mentioning, of course. And there's another guitar player, Brian. Tim Renwick plays guitar and percussionist Gary Wallace and another keyboard player, John Karen. And there's a shitload of background singers. I'm not going to mention them all, obviously, but then you got Michael Kamen doing all the orchestration. So that's fucking cool because he's done a shitload of that for rock bands, right? I was just going to mention the orchestration piece is great. The back, the background singers, awesome. It's those layers, right? You need all those pieces, all those arrangements, those layers. Absolutely. 11 tracks, two instrumentals. And like we said, it's clocking in at 66, 23. So just over an hour. We're not going to go through all of them because this is supposed to be short and sweet, short as we yeah. can make it. We tend to ramble and pick Floyd, but we'll try to keep it tight. Uh, we're picking our top three tracks. You're the guest. Have at it, Bri. Give me your first one. All right. The top three for me were fairly easy. When we got to honorable mentions, man, I struggled with that. Number three, what do you want from me? The lyrics are, you know, asking questions. The title of the song is asking a question. That's a theme in a lot of their works. The wall question and response kind of lyrics so that carries through with this song too i like the lyrics it starts with a great simple bass line it's, uh, it's an e minor so that's always great to solo over voice and chords over and it shifts to a minor and then there's a climb from f sharp to c to c minor that's a cool little shift as well it creates some tension the whammy riffs the distorted solos they're freaking amazing it's a gilmore masterpiece man uh, Rolling Stone, an interesting fun fact about Rolling Stone's criticism of the album. They were hard on it, but they did like this track. They said this one was the only one that Gilmore seemed to care about playing on. I read that. That was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was hilarious, too. I didn't, I didn't quite get it at all. Yeah. I just kind of laughed at it myself. They kind of were hinting that Gilmore's kind of just doing the same old shit over and over, except this song. Yeah. Except right. this song. Yeah. Yeah. He does definitely lean into the guitar fills more than he does maybe on any other track. Uh, there's a weightness to it. Uh, it's a bit of a rocker compared to the other tracks. The melody is great. Rick Wright on keys is great. The drum fills by Nick Mason, they're great. The outro with the fading Jack. keys. Great. Right? Jack. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just great guitar work. And the vocals, the backing vocals, we talked about it. Ah, uh, what do you want from me? Oh, yeah. Like, there's so much weight to it. Just love that. But it's a concept album, right? So it goes from What Do You Want From Me straight into Pulls Apart, which is another great track. But that's my number three. You can lose yourself this night. What 
And I, I feel like we're going to probably overlap a lot on this one. <laughs> Because it's yeah, it was my first pick. Too. I had a feeling too. Yeah, I had a yeah. feeling we will. Yeah. Well, there's some obvious standouts to me. That's so I'm like, oh, Brian and I are going to pick the same ones probably. But anyway, oh, another fun fact I didn't mention. Apparently, they had 65 pieces of music for this album. Then they whittle it down to 27 apparently, and then democratically voted on which of those 27 made the final 11. I thought so. Gilmore's not Mr. Iron Hand apparently. Like they voted on it which ones to continue, you know, working on or whatever. So there you go. Yeah, that democratic approach, pretty cool. That's that's something you wouldn't get with the water still in the band. The end of the real full Pink Floyd, he was writing solo albums, especially the final cut. <laughs> Wasn't so much of a democracy. Yeah, right. Exactly. Okay, what can I add to what you said, Brian? You did a great job there. Uh, I got slow yet rocking ballad is what I wrote down. <laughs> I dig the start. There's that just little drum roll, keyboard solo, guitar solo, right off the top. Blues vibe. I'm a sucker for that. I'm in. I mean, I'm in. Here's something I think is cool lyrically, Brian, is, uh, you know, Waters, especially with The Wall, you know, that theme of alienating yourself from the audience, you know, with The Wall, fuck the audience, just shut up and listen to us and alienation or whatever. Of course, you can interpret lyrics however you want but this is what this sounds like to me as you look around the room tonight settle in your seats and dim the lights do you want blood do you want my tears what do you want from me should i sing until i can't sing anymore play these strings until my fingers are raw you're so hard to please what do you want from me so that has that roger lyrical vibe in in terms of that don't you think it's kind of cool especially the way you just read it out like that right it totally has a roger Roger vibe to it. Roger yeah. could have easily sang that. He could have done the question and response piece, the comfortably numb, that kind of vibe to it. Right? Yeah. So I thought that was kind of neat. And yeah, Gilmore cranks out some fucking heavy blues riffage on this one, man. The solo, like you said, it's what he does best. What's not to like? What do you want from a song? How about that? We often do that. When right? We're watching something live or just talking about music. What do you want? <laughs> What more right? do you fucking want? Give me your number two, buddy. We're getting into really the crux of the album for me. Why I love it so much. Yeah. Number two is coming back to life. So this one was written alone by Gilmore. You you mentioned just earlier there that there was a lot of input, a lot of collaboration, a lot of democratic decisions. This one Gilmore wrote. But man, the intro in this one is so fucking tasty. I think it's a C, A minor pentatonic based arrangement. It has an octave shift. He does a little opening solo, then he shifts it up an octave. Hey, fuck, man. Goosebumps are going over him. I'm just getting goosebumps, right? Just thinking about it. For those of you wondering, you're not going to hear any of this type of shit from me, octaves and B minor. This is not fucking (laughs) happening. This is why I love having Brian on the show, man. He fucking dials that shit in. Like, you can hear somebody shred all day long from Steve Vai to Joe Satch. We love all that stuff. It's great. But if you want to just hear a guy... Have a soulful blue type of style playing. Dude, man, this is it. It's just the bluesy as fuck, man. It's just that slow blues thing, and I that gets me every fucking time. Has a great, simple driving bass groove. I love that. The lyrics are great poetry. Maybe I'll let you do the lyrics. You're great at the lyrics. What makes you think I picked this one, Brian? You just you don't know. <laughs> That's true. I don't know. The verse, while you were hanging yourself on someone else's words, dying to believe in what you heard, I was staring, 
straight into the shining sun. And then the drums and the bass line kick back in and the momentum builds. While you were hanging yourself on someone else's words, dying to believe in what you heard, I was staring straight into the shining. And it's just a simple in the pocket kind of a groove. I love that kind of melody, the soloing over top of. It might be one of my favorite solos actually he's ever he's ever done. Coming back to life, man, it's fucking great. And you got me thinking, because I know guys, I'm not going to mention any names, <laughs> <laughs> who don't click with Gilmore. I like a lot of things in music. Either you get it. not I shouldn't say get it. That sounds like a put down. Either it's music to your ears and you dig it and you get what he's doing and it moves you or it doesn't. And it definitely does for me too. He can pretty much solo anything and I'm going to like it, right? But I know guys that it doesn't hit them like that, right? And that's fair enough. But I'm with you. I think he's fucking unbelievable. It's not how many notes you play. It's which notes you're playing and how you're playing them. Yes. And it just exactly, moves yeah. me to the nth degree. I could not agree with you more, man. He's got that similar kind of thing, like, like an Eric Johnson thing at times. Like, uh, you know, that slower Eric Clampton, that kind of bluesy, slow groove. There's even a little bit of Jeff Beck in some of the stuff he does. He's as good as those guys, man. So if you like those guys, what is there not to like about Gilmore? Right. It's funny you mentioned that. I just recently saw a clip, and it's not a new clip. I was on YouTube down the rabbit hole like I always am. But it was Gilmore. There's somebody asked him who his favorite guitar player was. And it's like, you can tell already. He's like, fuck, there's so many. But he goes, if I have to pick one, it's Jeff Beck. So there you go. Okay, man, my number two is not that one, Brian. My number two is Keep Talking. Interesting. So that's written by Dave and Mr. Wright and lyrics by Polly. Sampson, as we mentioned, she did a lot of the lyrics. My fun facts in this one is the first single, believe it or not, is this one. It was the group's third number one hit on the album rock charts, whatever that is, <laughs> staying there for six weeks. <laughs> it was sung by Gilmore, and it's the one that features the Stephen Hawking, his electronic voice from that TV commercial. So apparently Gilmore was watching this commercial, and he was moved to tears by it, apparently. The quote is, the most powerful piece of television advertising I've ever seen in my life is what Dave said. So he's like, well, I'm going to put this in my song, which exactly what he did. As far as the song itself, I like it. It's got that guitar echo delay effect throughout that main riff, which is very Floyd. It reminds me another brick in the wall, right? It's got that vibe that, you know, it's that echoey vibe. It's immediately Pink Floyd. Cool keyboard textures from Rick Wright. And I love the bringing the backup singers up again that call and response lyrically. So Dave's like, I can't seem to speak now. You never talk to me. <laughs> My words don't come out right. right. What are you thinking? And it's really cool, man. I think I should speak now. Why won't you talk to me? But I can't seem to speak now. You never talk to me. My words won't come out right. What are you On repeat, the solo is fucking awesome. Of course it is. It's David Gilmore. But he uses the talk box on this one. That's right. You can overdo a talk box. Oh, totally. But he doesn't. He just picks it every once in a while. And I love a talk box, man. It's at the end of the track, kind of in the outro. Very cool, tasty. It's an awesome song. I love it. <laughs> Keep talking. 
shocking. Yeah, I, I thought you might go with that one because I think when we did top 10 songs, Young Lust was one of your songs. Absolutely. And I can hear I can hear Young Lust in this a little bit in the middle of the track. It has the same kind of guitar tone. So, Okay, number three. Number three. Gee, I wonder what it's going to be. <laughs> I know exactly what it – well, if it's not what I think it is, I will be shocked. But go ahead. Let me just say, man, when I think of the division bell, this is the first thing I think of. It's the cathedral bell coming in on the offbeats with that fucking simple piano. It's the title track. No, it's not the title track. It should be, maybe. It should be. That's a good point. I think they should have just called it division bell. They should have called the Alma High Hopes, Brian. Yes. It's got that cathedral bell coming in on the offbeats. That simple piano coming in at the beginning, man. It's fucking great. It kind of reminds me a little bit like the final cut. It's so good, man. It's a builder. has that uh, breakdown just to the piano and the church bells that we talked about. Those are sampled. You, I think you talked about a uh, fun fact. The bell is a reference to the House of Commons bell, calling the members of the house to come and vote on the issues and divide the division bell. Epic uh, lap steel solo uh, and the arrangement, the orchestra, they work so well together. The sound he gets out of lap, that lap steel is the melodies. Come on, man. The melody in this song. Oh, my God. So fucking good, man. His, his compositions are so good. Just off the charts for me. Like hair raising, just fucking goosebumps. <laughs> is king here he could shred his ass off if he wanted to that's not his thing man that's not his goal he wants to move you and melody's gonna do it every fucking time and the military style drums in there the building orchestration it's very the wall it's very waters like which we love right and then it just comes back down and it's the bell ringing and fades out and it's just a right. fucking great end to a great album Right, it ends the way it began, which is bookended and it is fucking awesome. No shocker here, but yeah, that's my third pick too, man. Written by Gilmore and his <laughs> wife, Polly. Yeah, she did the lyrics again. Uh, what can I say? I got some fun facts. It was the second single. A little fun fact for you. There's a music video for this one. Again, directed by Storm. It features references to Cambridge, where Sid and Roger and David grew up. There's references yeah. to that. There's a bust of Sid in the video. So it meant, again, Sid's everywhere. And at the very end, you know, Floyd, they like the ear candy, even without Roger there. The church bell fades out and you hear a little chunk of a phone call between the band's manager and Gilmore's son, apparently. Charlie is who that is. Like, if you really got to dial it up, you got to have the headphones on, basically. You might have said this, but I, I really want to reinforce the fact that, that, you know, the verses pull back and then that chorus is fucking huge. That dichotomy is, I love it. I'm just a sucker for that, right? It's moody as hell. It's very Floyd, this one. Another thing I want to mention, Brian, there's that acoustic guitar solo that's once again could have been, you know, right off the wall. It's that climbing vibe. It's that climbing Floyd thing they yeah. do all the yeah. time, right? Yeah. And I never get tired of it. I was learning how to play it last night, actually. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> Climbing riff. That's what I, yeah, Some, exactly. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, something like that. That's pretty close, dude. Nice work. It 
again, the word that comes to mind for this one is drama. It's really dramatic. It's my favorite song on the album, just like you. It's a no brainer. I never tired of it. It's awesome. High fucking hopes. The grass was green. The light was brighter. The taste was sweet. The nights of wonder. With friends surrounded. Hey, honorable mention. What do you got? You said you struggled with the honorable. What do you got, man? I had keep talking in there. I had pulls apart in there, but I went to the one that won the Grammy for uh, best instrumental, Marooned. Another great example of Gilmore outlining the melody with his guitar works. It, it has that very atmospheric start. Again, that building of layers, of orchestration, those layers of sound that I just love. In fact, it reminds me of some of the stuff in uh, Waters most recent arrangement of Comfortably Numb, the one we saw live, those sound effects that kind of, and they just trail off. I just love that. And there's that high sonic end in it, the guitar on me effect again over the chords. We talked about Jeff Beck. I can hear Jeff Beck in this song, some of the tones, some of the things he's doing with the guitar. Yeah, I just love it. It's headphone shit. It's headphone shit, absolutely, man. mention is A Great Day for Freedom, written solely by Dave. It's a Gilmore composition. It's a leftover for momentary lapse of reason, actually. This one's got a sad emotion to it, man. It's just a beautiful piece of music, I think. It just starts with Gilmore's voice and that piano, and then it just builds. If you like Floyd, you're going to like, you like a builder, right? And that's exactly what this is. Because once it gets into it, the orchestra comes in, and it just gets more powerful and more emotional, right? And the outro solo from Gilmore is, of course, awesome. <laughs> I mean, it's, come on, repeat. And A Great Day for Freedom, it's about the Berlin Wall coming down. And, of course, the Floyd geeks, apparently, were all over this saying, well, it's about Gilmore's conflict with Waters and the band and all this, right? So his quote on that is, I'm happy for people to interpret the division bell any way they like, but maybe I know what a caution should be sounded because you can read too much into it. A Great Day for Freedom, for example, has got nothing to do with Roger or his wall. It just doesn't. What else can I say? So anyway, you slice it. I dig the track and it's my honorable. Man, let's sum it up, man. Any final thoughts? Anything we didn't uh, cover that you want to mention about this album and how much you love it or what? One thing I'd like to mention is the is the tour. So when they came to Edmonton, saw them uh, in concert. Yes, we did. This album was... <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about that, Brian. Let's talk about that. So Brian and I went to Edmonton, to Commonwealth Stadium. And the only time in my recollection of my concert going live, I... For once, was the annoying person. Usually there's somebody around me annoying the shit out of me by singing too much or fucking doing whatever. Well, I was definitely the annoying guy in our group. I was too many cocktails before the show, Bri, and I had my singing voice on. I was singing songs that he wasn't, they weren't even playing, if I'm not mistaken. I think I was saying, hey, you, singing, hey, you at one point, and they're they're not playing that. <laughs> When it's a road trip and you're preloading and you need to get to the show and you're already fucking cut, you have a few more before they come out. Yeah, I was a little, uh, I was a little bit more inebriated than I wanted to be myself too, to enjoy it. But man, I remember, I remember how good it sounded. Oh yeah, the sound was amazing. Yeah, they didn't do much off the album. They only did like I think two, maybe three songs 
off of Division Bell, which was fine with me. It was all the good. It was all the hits. <laughs> Did we take a bus with a bunch of Pink Floyd people? Yes. Is, am I making that up? Well, that's the problem. Nobody's driving. Yeah. All the guardrails are off. Like, we just went for it, man. And you're right. We didn't get so sloppy. I remember the show. It wasn't that bad, but bad enough. <laughs> when you're on the bus and the cocktails are coming. It was fucking go time, man. Well, let's. I'll, I'll hold this up while we're talking about it then. So this is Pulse. Right. Yeah, yeah. So this was recorded at uh, Earl's Court in the UK. So this is this tour. And I don't know, I mean, I don't know if the set list was exactly the same as what you and I saw. It probably was, Brian. So you were close, Brian. They did four tracks from Division Bell. Okay. Then a smattering of hits. And then they did the entire second half was uh, Dark Side in its entirety. That was fucking Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The only lame part about this, it's shot on video. So it's four by three. So it can only look so good. I mean, it looks good. But it's four by three aspect, which is a bummer. But it's, it's really good. I highly recommend it. Oh, yeah. It might not be Roger Waters, Pink Floyd. But fuck, man, it's fucking good, man. You can't deny that. It's up there with me, almost with like Wish You Were Here or something. Look at the time. Look at the time. (laughs) (laughs) Pump the brakes, McCullough. Pump the brakes. (laughs) I just love the guitar work. I just love it. I just fucking love it. Okay, uh, my closing thoughts. uh, You mentioned a quote already, the Rolling Stone one. I got a couple more for you. One's, uncut magazine this guy writes might just be the dark horse of the floyd cannon the opening trip tech how's that for a big word how about just saying the opening three songs would that be or (laughs) or a hugely impressive return to something very close to the eternal essence of pink floyd so this guy dug it my final quote this is awesome roger waters however his quote he dismissed the division bell as just rubbish nonsense from beginning to end (laughs) I'm glad you did that because I read that too. I read that too. <laughs> well, Roger was a little bitter at this point, right? He's playing theaters and they're playing stadiums. I mean, come on. <laughs> There's not much objectivity in his criticism at all. It's, no, yeah. I laughed when I heard that, man. I like about half of this album. The rest doesn't do a ton for me, but the half I like, I really like. At the end of the day, I just want to hear Gilmore play his guitar. And in terms of, I mean, this technically wasn't their last album. To me, it is. Endless River is outtakes and stuff i don't really count that one but if you're going to end your career on an album it's good it's seven out of ten for me basically right like you said i I think you touched on it earlier like that top 10 pink floyd songs we did neither one of us had anything off momentary or this one so that tells you that's a good point that tells you something check that out episode 68 so it is down here compared to the classic stuff it's still fucking good dude yeah it's still good and momentary laps you put that above this just i do yeah yeah not by a ton And why? But I do. Just curious why. It's just a little more rocking to me. Right. (laughs) I knew you were going to say that. Dogs of War, (laughs) you know. But even on the turning away, that's not really rocking, but I like that one a lot. Right. Learning to Fly, fine. It's a radio song, but it's cool. Yeah, it is. It's more rocking for sure. It's a little more rocking. You know where I am, Brian. I know where where you are, man. Yeah. For the rock. I knew that's why. I I already knew the answer to the question. That's what I wanted to hear. It's a little more (laughs) rocking. What am I, 15 again? I am. I'm 15. What can I say? Thanks for joining me, Brian. As always, when it comes to the Floyd, you're my go to guy. That was awesome. Thanks, you guys, for tuning in. We really appreciate you taking the time. As always, let us know what you think of Pink Floyd's Division Bell in the comments. We'd love to hear your memories of this album, your thoughts. Absolutely. You can find us on all the socials, wherever podcasts are broadcast. Please do me a solid. Hit that subscribe button, kids. I want to hit 1,000. I'm nowhere near 1,000. Let's hit it. And until next time, on behalf of Brian McCullough and I, keep rock alive, people. Peace out. Peace out. Elvis has left the building.